I moved you up in the corner. Yep, so you're up and ready. So we're just uh, like to welcome everybody as we just wait a couple of minutes or a minute or two here for everybody to join that's going to. Um, we're pretty excited. We're not pretty, we're very excited this uh, to launch a vet chat series with uh, someone who means a lot to us here at Grayson, and that's Dr. Steve Reed. Uh, Dr. Reed is uh, not only a veterinarian, uh, root and riddle, and, and specialized in internal medicine, but uh, more importantly to us here at Grayson, he uh, chairs the Research Advisory Committee, uh, and Dr. Reed does a tremendous job for that. And the Research Advisory Committee is what allows us to uh, select a the research that we choose to fund every year. About uh, on August 1st, uh, we'll have anywhere from 50 to 70 uh, grants submitted. And Dr. Reed leads the team of 32 uh, veterinarians uh, that uh, review all that research and provide recommendations to the board. So uh, Grayson, we'll th we're very thankful for his uh, uh, work and volunteering to lead that committee. It's been great and thanks a lot, Dr. Reed, for that. Um, so uh, this week, based on some of the feedback and success we had with the Welfare and Safety of the Racehorse Summit uh, and recording these webinars uh, and posting them to YouTube, uh, we had some additional feedback asking for general ho health horse topics. Uh, and one that came to the top of mind with us was uh, neurological diseases, and Dr. Reed's a leading expert in those. Uh, and today he's going to talk to us about uh, EPM uh, and Wobbler syndrome, uh, two neurological diseases that, uh, as we like to say in Grayson, uh, disease knows uh, no breed or discipline of a horse. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn off my camera and uh, turn it over to Dr. Reed. But for those of you uh, in attendance, you can ask questions as we go along with the Zoom chat feature at the bottom of the screen. Just uh, hit your questions. Uh, and at the end of the presentations, well, I'll, I'll come back on and we'll go through some of them with Dr. Reed. Uh, and again, Dr. Reed, thanks so much for taking the time today. My pleasure, Jamie. Thank you. And thank everybody who's online. And I, I would second uh, what Jamie said about uh, several things. Number one, had an opportunity to serve the uh, Jockey Club by, uh, in Grayson by getting to review grant, grants. And uh, to chair that committee is one of the best things that I knew uh, as part of my job as a veterinarian. Uh, today we're going to talk about two of the most common causes of neurologic disease in the horse. Uh, the first is cervical vertebral stenotic myelopathy uh, or true wobblers and the second is uh, EPM. Uh, I put this picture up there. Uh, th this, this guy is me, uh, only at that time I had uh, dark hair and everything and uh, I was giving a, a talk uh, to a group of individuals at Shack Parish, and those of you who know Indian Creek probably know Shack. He arranged with uh, Roger Barkley, who's next to him, and uh, there's uh, Dr. Tim Green from the uh, Royal Vet College, Lawrence Gearing Royal Vet College, and Nick Winfield Bigby. At any rate, uh, this is a, uh, a problem that I've been interested in for a long time. That was the reason I put that in there. But uh, true wobblers, it's, it's a common cause of clumsiness in uh, horses, it's a developmental problem most often affects young light breed horses. Uh, and this is uh, generally, it's a uh, disorder that can also sometimes show up in older horses. Uh, when it does there, they've usually got degenerative arthritis that may actually have started as a, an OCD in the neck when they were young. Uh, what do we see? We see it in much more commonly in uh, male over female, almost three to one. We see it in lots of breeds, but thoroughbreds uh, kind of lead the way, and then warm bloods and Tennessee walkers. Uh, the age and onset, uh, it's, it's most of the time before two years of age, uh, but the onset can be a little bit later. Um, but this is just to give you a little bit of an idea of how this developmental problem occurs. So when you have a mare that's, that's bred, uh, the, the um, Early on, so the vertebral development starts as soon as that mare gets bred. And while the uh, baby's in utero, there's going to be uh, lots of skeletal changes, ossification, prenatal growth period. And then after birth, there's going to be a very rapid postnatal growth period. 
uh, with, you know, some changes, uh, you know, puberty occurring out between one and two years of age. Um, and then closure of the vertebral growth plates doesn't occur fully until they're almost five or six years of age. So the, basically what happens is when they're bred, the genotype is set. What they're going to look like is going to be impacted by the siren dam uh, right away. Uh, there's going to be a chance for these developmental problems, and most of them are osteochondrosis. So that lack of ability to convert a cartilage model into bone. And uh, a lot of those things are occurring and developing during that uh, while their uh, baby's still in utero, followed by some changes after birth. But then there are all these post-environment and nutritional influences. So those are epigenetic factors. Uh, so there's some genetic factors, and then there's all these other environmental factors that we can deal with uh, after they are, are uh, already born during that uh, period of very rapid growth and up through puberty. And uh, this is an, uh, a look at 252 thoroughbreds that I looked at while here at, uh, at Rude Grill, and you can see this is the onset time. So uh, we got a little peak right here at about six, seven months, so right at the end of that rapid postnatal growth period. And then the biggest peak uh, was out here between one and two years of age, uh, you know, for when they hit puberty, but then we get some uh, wobblers that have their onset all the way out to six years of age. And the kind of changes that we're talking about are, are, are mostly this developmental OCD, things that can cause an OCD in a stifle or a hock or a shoulder joint can also occur in the vertebral column. So things are, are happening there. They can get epiphysitis in the vertebral column, just like they can on the long bones. Uh, and they can get changes in the soft tissue, the ligaments that are in there, because uh, if there's instability, these ligaments start to hypertrophy to try to stabilize things. Uh, all of them together lead to narrowing of the canal. How do we make the diagnosis of this? Well, first thing we're going to do is do a neuro exam, take neck radiographs, maybe do a myelogram. We're going to do spinal fluid analysis, and that'll be uh, equally or more important when we talk about EPM. And so we're going to uh, use the blood and spinal fluid to rule out other causes of the disease. The neuro exam, I believe, all veterinarians ought to do it as simple extension of the a physical examination. You know, watch how the horse moves. They need to watch the horse, listen to how its feet uh, uh, land and what it's doing, and then they need to record what they see and hear. And for me, there are several things that sometimes the signs can be quite subtle. So just before, uh, just before coming to this, uh, we did a, uh, uh, a neuro exam and a monogram on a weanling. Well, actually, it's, it, it's still on the mare, a pole still on the mare because it had narrowing of the canal. So, and it's got fairly subtle signs. So you need to look closely at them. We usually grade the neuro signs from zero to five. Zero being normal, five being a horse that's recumbent. So somewhere in there, grade one is very subtle, two is more obvious but not terrible, or grade three and four are pretty clumsy and difficult to ride. So there are lots of other things that we can do as a part of it, but one little tip that I put out there for uh, people is look for wobbler heels, horses that frequently either pull the front shoes off or they shear their heels uh, because of that. What do we do after we've uh, done the neuro exam? Well, we start to do imaging. And this is just to show the C1, C2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and the first thoracic vertebra that's here. So that's what we've got there, uh, just looking at the vertebral column in the neck. And we're gonna start with just plain radiographs, then we're gonna put dye in the space around the spinal cord and we're going to outline that. We can do CT and if the lesion is really high in the neck or in the brain, we can do an MRI. So this is just to show you what it looks like when your horse might come to us. Standing films, we're taking the x-ray. You can see the skull, C1, C2, right on down the neck, two, three, four, five, and then four, five, six and all the way down to that first thoracic vertebrae. So 
standing radiographs can give us a pretty good idea of whether or not the vertebra are in alignment and we can measure the width of the spinal canal and compare it to the width of the vertebral body and we can get a, a somewhat of a prediction about whether it's too narrow. The next thing we might do is we'd be doing a myelogram where we put contrast in there. So here's the standing film. There's some kind of a bony change that we might see there. Here we can see an OCB lesion between five and six. And we can see that there's narrowing, the dye is that white part of that. And so this is showing these changes that can be seen both on standing radiographs on the right or on the myelogram here. One thing that uh, has been really helpful is the addition of CT, because now we're looking at things in three dimensions. We can look at it from the side, from the top, and transversely. And if there's bony changes on these articular processes, well, we might be able to see that and look what it's doing to the spinal cord, putting a lot of pressure and changing the shape of the spinal cord. Other times you can see bony changes without shape change. So those are the, some of the things that we need to, to be looking at to look at the, um, the, the spinal cord with that study. Radiographic measurements have been out there and uh, some people have, have done uh, a lot of different techniques, but the one that's most accurate for predicting whether or not a horse might become a wobbler is the width of the uh, vertebral canal compared to the width of the vertebral body in the same plane. And when you have a, um, in, at C6, which is what we're looking at, that ratio ought to be 52% or more. And so you see in this case, it's 46%, meaning that the probability uh, is that this could be a wobbler or this in, and for C7, normal is 56%. And so at 52%, both of those are sus uh, making us very worried and suspicious that it might be narrow. And so uh, the work that was done by Dr. Uh, one of my residents at Ohio State, Dr. Reich, uh, and I was to look at all of the vertebrae and to establish what would be a normal uh, uh, measurement. And you can even measure between vertebra as well as within individual vertebra. And again, if this value gets under 48% uh, between vertebrae, then that's too narrow. So these are things that give us the potential to make a prediction. What other things uh, would we do? Well, the next thing we would do is we would do a, a spinal tap. And here we've uh, got the atlanta occipital space and we're doing a spinal tap. We're going to put a needle in there, collect spinal fluid, put contrast in, and then take x-rays and we're very fortunate. We have a table that we can move the sleeping horse on the table to get it over our uh, x-ray uh, machine. And then we can just take films all the way down and you can see the dye going even into the thoracic vertebral column. And we shoot the films in neutral, in flexed, and you can see one of our technicians holding the head in a flex position and in an extended position. So then we can also make measurements here to get a prediction, uh, but just without worrying about any numbers, when you see contrast above and below the spinal cord, and then you see an area like this, well, that tells us between five and six, it's too narrow and there's pinching of that spinal cord. And it's not all bony. There may be some soft tissue uh, outchings of the joint capsule that might add to that narrowing there. Uh, we can also measure the width of the uh, dorsal contrast column. And, uh, and, but this measurement down here is, is probably the most helpful thing uh, because it shows a substantial attenuation. And, uh, and that's how we know whether or not this horse might need surgery. Uh, the third and final thing that we might do is measure the total dural diameter of the contrast and compare it from spaces ahead and behind. Uh, just checking to see if somebody's text me like maybe there's a, a question. Uh, but at any rate, and you can see right here 
how significantly attenuated the uh, contrast column is uh, using that total dural central diameter. Uh, there's a lot of work out there showing these measurements and uh, how to utilize them and how to make interpretations of it. Uh, but, but the bottom line is the uh, standing films is a, is a help to give us a predictive value. The monogram is much more beneficial in that it can give us a much more accurate assessment. And then uh, the, the most recently we've started doing the uh, CT studies and that's going to give us some of the best way to evaluate it. Here's what the horse looks like when it's sleeping in, in our CT unit. And uh, we're very lucky to have this unit in the horses on a table and the CT actually is uh, moves on its own. Once it's programmed, it walks along and will take the radiographs as it goes over top of the horse, allowing us to look at everything. So spinal cord, central canal, uh, e e extradural space in there, the uh, uh, articular process cartilages, the intervertebral uh, uh, joint space. And this is where the nerve roots come out. So C would be those are going to be the nerves that are coming out of there to go to the uh, muscles of the front leg uh, in that they come out in that cervical region. So the CT can be very, very helpful. The thing it, it's most helpful for is lateralizing lesions. When we're looking at them on the straight regular monogram, we can't tell if something's in a lateralizing lesion like you can see here. And then, as I said, we can also look at it from the top by removing the bone there and looking at where the spinal cord is within there and whether or not there's impingement from the side. So there are just lots of things that CT generates for us. If we're looking for a lesion in the head, then the, an, a, an MRI can be helpful, but you cannot get uh, the neck into that region. We did do one study on horses that were uh, deceased where we could then get the neck into there. And on that, it showed us that if we could build a, a magnet large enough, we could get some really good measurements because this was very accurate in sorting out whether which are the uh, true wobblers from which are not uh, by measurements. Uh, what do we do if we get a wobbler? How do we treat it? Well. Uh, there are a couple of things that can be done, but one is surgical correction now. And innovations in surgery uh, that are based on what people know and uh, what they've learned over time. The surgeon in charge at our hospital is Dr. Brett Woody. Uh, my job is to do the diagnostic workup, to do the post-op care, establish the rehab, and then during surgery, I scrub in with him and hand instruments. So. I'm the assistant, not the, Dr. Woody is the surgeon. Um, the, the technique, Dr. George Bagby, an MD surgeon and, uh, in Spokane, was, he's deceased now, but Dr. Bagby was helping the folks at Washington State University College of Medicine, uh, and they developed a technique for uh, putting a cage, this Bagby basket, in between affected vertebrae. And the hole that they drilled was an eighth of a millimeter smaller than the implant. So that when you put that in, it pushed the vertebrae apart and allowed the bone to grow back through in order to stop and stabilize uh, the, the, that area. And this is what it looks like when you get a really good fusion. So there's C2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 5, and five, six, and what you can see here that's so interesting is when you have really good fusion at sites of narrowing, these degenerative articular processes atrophy away. So here's a normal joint. Here's a joint starting to develop little arthritis. And we did this horse's surgery when it was two years old, and uh, it was finally euthanized at about 15 years of age. So I had plenty of time for that to atrophy, which gave more room for the spinal cord to live in, uh, in there. 
Newer uh, techniques involve a, a threaded implant that we put in. So here's what it looks like, Dr. Woody. There's my job helping position the horse. We get the horse uh, under anesthesia in, in a really good position. And then Dr. Woody makes an incision along the ventral midline. We dissect the muscles away. Uh, we have to remove this little uh, spike of bone there so that we can see the actual space between the two vertebrae in order to be able to put this implant in there. The implant, um, it has a little ear. You can see that right there, a little uh, hole in that cylinder. And then that will go right onto this driver. And once we've got the site prepared, then we put that into place and thread it down the end, uh, twisting until it's tight. And, and those implants are locked in place because of that, uh, you know, of, of the twisting in place. The horse afterwards looks like this. You can see that um, here it is uh, the next day eating hay from a hay nap, but usually within one day, it's eaten off the floor. And so even though these are two different horses, uh, that, that's generally what happens. And because the incision's right on the ventral midline, once they heal, you don't even see a scar. And uh, this is just to give a little idea of what will happen with 195 surgical patients that Dr. Woody and I did, uh, 135 improved. Many of them, 104 improved more than two grades. Uh, a few didn't improve, and there were a few that worsened. Um, uh, there were some that we still don't know that are outcome because it's a little too soon to tell. But what do we do in the post-op care? Well, 30 days of stall rest, and uh, we take a radiograph, and at the end of that first month, often when the horse comes out of the stall, it's kind of weak, has a little muscle wasting, uh, so the neuro exam won't have changed significantly. And you can imagine if you or I sat on the couch for a month, we probably wouldn't be as strong and might be a little incoordinated as well. Uh, after that, we do 30 days of hand walking with gradual increasing amount of time. Then we do 30 days in a small paddock for turnout each month doing a, uh, another neuro exam to make sure that everything's healing properly. And I go and do that generally because most of our horses are right here in Central Kentucky. And uh, after we get that done, if they're doing well and everything is, the radiograph shows the bones healing nicely, they can go to a larger paddock. I do tell owners and trainers, you ought to be patient because it might take up to a year for the horse to fully rehabilitate and show how much improved coordination and strength is gonna have, which is one of the reasons that we wanna do the uh, diagnostics as early as possible. Sorry, I was talking too fast. Um, the, the, we, our goal is to improve strength and coordination, which then builds confidence in the horse because some of these horses, early on uh, when they have a neurologic problem, people will tell me, well, he's so spooky, doc. And uh, I think the reason for that is when they are uncertain of where their limbs are, it can cause them a, a problem. The rehabilitation can be... Uh, general at the beginning, but then it needs to be more specifically modified. And there are now groups, this group out of uh, Colorado State University uh, and a private company in, in Texas, also owned by the same folks, that will take a look at ways to help with the, the rehabilitation and to improve this uh, neuromuscular strength and coordination. Well, one of the things that are important in this disease, well, it's multifactorial. So there is a role for genetics uh, in this, in that it's not simple. It doesn't seem to be one gene in stallion and one gene in the mare that made up to give you this. Uh, but the other things that we see, uh, there are probably multiple genes on multiple alleles that, that uh, are important. And we are trying by following some families to see if we can determine what role genetics plays in this. Other factors, rapid growth. We see it in 
male over female, particularly males that grow rapidly to a large size. They often have a long neck and a big heavy head. We also see that uh, some of the bony changes are affected by what they're eating. So if they're eating to grow rapidly with high carbohydrate diets, particularly if those diets are de deficient in trace nutrients like copper and zinc or major nutrients like calcium and phosphorus, you might then have an added part of this. And then finally trauma. So and it doesn't have to be the horse flipped over in the field. It might just be the day-to-day -day trauma of Colts and Phillies playing hard in the field. All of those things can be important. Uh, we've got, uh, there was a, a, a breeding study that was done, real early one, done by Dimmick right here at the University of Kentucky, and he traced 43% of Wobblers to one sire. But then Dr. Wagner back in 87 did a Wobbler breeding study and, and bred Wobbler to Wobbler and didn't get Wobblers, but did get offspring that had a, had a high incidence of OCD and other bony abnormalities in the long bone of the body, not in the vertebral column. Um, so there are some things. I'm, I'm gonna finish up this part of the talk. We got four minutes uh, with, with a case in, and you might see the horse's name. This is a horse that belongs to Dr. Woody and I. So it's so a two-year-old that had some talent, uh, farm uh, had him looked at as a potential uh, uh, stallion prospect, but then he started to show weakness and ataxia. They treated him for EBM, they finally referred him for a monogram, and here he is. This is acoustical, July 7th, 2017. So, you know, you can see him uh, walking, and, and during the neuro exam, the thing that we most noted was, in particular with the white hind foot, he would drag that toe a lot, drag the toe frequently, and when he turned in small circles, would place that foot on uh, in abnormal positions. Uh, and you can you can almost see the toes worn off. When you elevate his head, you can see that he uh, starts to resist. He doesn't like that. I think he had some neck pain. And uh, you can also see when he comes back at you that when uh, Andrea walks in with his head elevated, he almost paces and he gets very, very upset and will start to almost reach high with those thoracic limbs, almost strike out. So I think that you know there are some uh, clinical signs that you can see not only in the gait of the horse, but also in, in their attitude. You see pictures left the thoracic limb up higher than the right as well. But he didn't particularly like having that chain over his nose, I think. Uh, but at any rate, so, so this was a horse that I called a grade two wobbler. Uh, and uh, here's the monogram. He had just a mild amount of pinching with a lot of bony change here at 5.6 and a little bit of change at 6.7. Lots of bony change, but only mild attenuation on the uh, monogram, but at two spots. Um, when we flexed him, those spots opened up, so that made us feel a little better. <laughs> About it. And this is him. I think it's better to watch him here. This is in the uh, post op period. <laughs> so after surgery, they always stay in the hospital about four to five days, and they can go back to the farm and they can uh, start hand walking and uh, eventually get to the point where they're going to be turned out. And, uh, you know, we try to walk them not only on the flat, but also walk them up and down hills, doing all sorts of things to make them work to have to improve clinically and, and to get better. And here's uh, finally the outcome. Is the 
even when they have two baskets in their neck, sometimes these horses can improve enough uh, to go back to the racetrack and to continue to perform. And uh, I just got on my virtual stable today that uh, a notification of the entry for June 23rd for his uh, first start out this year. So we've had him, uh, well, actually, the um, he just got off of a maybe a 60 or 90 day uh, layoff and he's just going to be starting back uh, in a couple of days. So some of these horses can in fact overcome their neurologic deficits with the surgery. And as you can see, he's able to come back uh, and do quite well. So. With that, uh, I'm sure if you have questions about, uh, um, you know, about CVM, Jamie, do we have any uh, that we need to yeah. deal with right now? Or yeah, Dr. Reed, we have a few questions, and for those of you uh, watching online, you can use your chat function uh, to ask the Q and A function. Excuse me, at the bottom of the Zoom platform to ask some questions. But a few of them. The first is, you said uh, one of the signs is pulling shoes or shearing heels. How often should you look for that? What What's the, you know, uh, amount of times compared to so, a regular? So uh, I, I think that's a really good question. Basically, what I, if you have a horse that does that once or twice, you might kind of ignore it. But if you have a horse that you just about get the heels, uh, as a young horse, he doesn't have shoes on, he just about gets a sheared heel healed up, and then he reaches up and tears it off again, then you might say maybe there's something that we ought to do a full, more careful neurologic exam on. Uh, and the same, once they've got him started in work and you got him shod, uh, then you ought to take a look there to see if, in fact, um, he is pulling his French shoes all the time. And then a uh, question, before the Bagby, Bagby, is that how you say it? Bagby That's basket? Correct. What, what was the treatment for Wild War Syndrome before the basket? There, there was, uh, in the earliest surgery, doing that cloward technique, some people used a bone uh, graft in there to fuse it. But prior to that, most everybody did nothing. They did conservative management with anti-inflammatories and time to see if they grew out of it. And if they did not, then sadly, most of those horses got put to sleep. Um, you know, and so it was not very, uh, there, there were not a lot of good surgical, uh, good options for them. So the hope, of course, it would be to recognize it early and, and, and see if you could do, uh, either get them to grow out of it by slowing down the rate of growth and, and, uh, and trying to keep them from traumatizing themselves. In other words, not playing too hard. Yeah, and then a, a, a related question is, are what are the ethics of doing basket surgery on horses intended to be racehorses for you? Uh, I think that's a really good question. Number one, uh, I've been involved with this surgery for more than, gosh, now almost 40 years. And, um, you know, touch wood, we've never had a horse. We've had certainly had horses after the surgery that have fallen, but we've never had a horse, uh, you know, have a problem. And because of the fact that they're not going to be ready to go into training or racing until, like I said, almost a year or sometimes more afterwards, then you're going to have had multiple veterinarians looking at that horse and they're going to them, uh, deem that the horse is safe to train, safe to race. So I think that's a, a really good thing. The other side of that ethical question is, uh, if it was one gene in the state and one gene in the mare, then I think we'd be really hesitant to think about breeding these animals. And in fact, even knowing that it's a complicated genetic scheme, we would still recommend not line breeding. We'd, we'd, we'd strongly recommend or encourage outcrossing. The last one project that I'm still involved with, and I have an adjunct faculty appointment at the University of Kentucky, is that we are looking at families, two families, that have had a, a number of, of uh, wobblers to see if we can really get a better understanding of the role of genetics. Hope mm -hmm. that addresses the ethics. I think it does. And then you mentioned uh, other symptoms or things to look for uh, for these horses. And one of them you said was heavier heads. Does that mean heavier horses are more susceptible or just? 
the way they do it, it's mostly the Simian light breeds, but they often have a long neck and they're horses with big heads. I don't know, that's just a, you know, a, an observation that I've made over time, you know, of looking at a lot of wobblers, particularly a majority of the horses that I look at are thoroughbreds. Yeah. So, you know, well then, and then a, another question is, does wobbler syndrome get worse with age? If they have uh, a, a, those bony lesions, those OCD lesions in the neck, and if you don't do anything about it, then they might progress over time. Uh, on the other hand, once the growth plates in the neck close, uh, they may stop on their own traumatizing your spinal cord. And so some horses that are just left to be turned out that never get the benefit of a, of a proper workup, or even if they have been worked up, never go to surgery, they might actually be able to improve with time uh, and, and growing. So I don't know, does that answer Jamie or is there Yeah, it sure do? does, yeah. And that wraps up all the questions we have on the first part. So I'll let you get uh, started on the second part of the EPM presentation. Okay, let's see. Is a three-year-old thoroughbred gelding. Now we got it. Is that working now, Jamie? Yep, there you go, thanks. Thank you. So this is a, a three-year-old thoroughbred gelding that had been used in a, he started as a racehorse and then uh, wasn't good at that. So they turned him into a, a jumper and Dr. he came to Dr. Ruggles and I, that's Dr. Ruggles doing a lameness exam on the horse. And uh, you can see that, uh, now watch as Brent trots him off there. He was a little lame in that left hind leg. And, uh, and Dr. Ruggles, uh, when he, he did uh, a workup on him and he blocked him uh, up to the hock, he, he showed lame in the left pelvic limb, right thoracic limb. Uh, after he blocked him the hock, he went lame in the right front. He blocked the left rear to below the hock, and then uh, he was off in that right front. He blocked the right front foot, and the horse went sound. But we didn't have a good uh, uh, cause for that. So I did a neuro exam. I'm going to go back a slide because I want everybody to watch this right as it starts. So he kind of paces right as soon as he's, as he's uh, moving there. He's starting to, uh, to make some pacing moves. And when you watch him walk, he's very stiff behind, doesn't flex the hocks real well, which again, that could be from a, a lameness problem. But when you elevate the head, he starts to drag the toe of the right pelvic limb, and he picks the feet up at uneven heights. And with the heads up, you can see him reaching more with the thoracic limbs. When we walked him in circles, he, he was a little awkward. You can see how he's worn the toes off of all the limbs. He throws the outside pelvic limb wider than you would expect. He does that going in both directions, plops that left hind down, and walking up and down a small hill is a little bit more difficult for him. And you'll see the next time down the hill with his head elevated, how animated he becomes with the uh, thoracic limbs. And then, uh, then we'll move on to the next slide. So you see him reaching higher, especially with that left thoracic limb. So uh, he was ridden in a clinic on a Saturday. He came to us on a Monday. He was lame and mildly ataxic. We didn't determine the cause. So we recommended to go exercise a horse further see if we could get him to show a real lameness. And then we'd look at him again. Six days later, the owner called, and this is what she had. Now, Albert, that's his name, he went down and was unable to ride. So here's a horse that six days after our initial uh, examination of seeing him went from a mildly ataxic horse with a lameness to this horse, which you'll see in a second is barely able to walk. Look at him when he walks out. It was at around Thanksgiving time that we saw him. 
we did uh, uh, we did further studies on him to confirm he wasn't a wobbler. We made sure he was negative for herpes. And now when we did six days after getting a very weak positive on a Western blot, now we have uh, other tests, this ELISA and the Western blot were very, very strongly positive. And then here he is. I'm just trying to shut off the sound on this. But uh, it, it took a while, but after treatment, we were able to get to the point. I got to move this out of the way so I can. Oh, crap. I'm just trying to shut the sound off and can't seem to do it. But anyway, so there he is. Um, but you can see that he's made a lot of improvement from a horse that was unable to rise. So over the next 18 months, he, he would wax and wane. He would seem to get better, then he would relapse. So we did that myelogram to make sure he wasn't a wobbler, and we continued to test him for EPM, and he was, and he was uh, uh, always positive. So what we ended up doing was putting him down, and he had organisms despite treatment. So this horse taught us a lot about EBM, you know. Here's another example. What does EBM look like? Well, they're clumsy. They often have asymmetric involvement, one side worse than other. They often have muscle atrophy, like you can see over this left hip here. They can't even have abnormal upper airway function associated with, um, you know, with the EP, uh, with EBM. They might have a head tilt, facial nerve paralysis, occasionally even seizures. And I've already shown this before. Here was that muscle atrophy uh, of both the temporalis only on one side. And this horse had profound atrophy of the masseter muscles on one side of the face. And you can see it right there. So how do we diagnose it? Well, they start with the neuro exam, take neck x-rays to make sure they don't look like a wobbler. And then you do a spinal tap. And we usually collect from the lumbosacral space we look for antibodies in the blood and compare them to the antibodies in the spinal fluid. So normally whatever is in the blood will leak into the spinal fluid, but at only about one one hundred, so a very tiny amount. Here are multiple labs that do the testing. Uh, the one that I most commonly use is uh, uh, Equine Diagnostic Solutions, which is right here in Lexington. And in the interest of full disclosure, I consult for them. If there's a, a veterinary question, they don't have veterinarians in the lab, they'll have the uh, people call me. So here's what I was saying. Normally, the, uh, the uh, antibodies all stay in the blood. A little bit of them will leak over into the spinal fluid, uh, you know, as a little bit of albumin that's that so cold leaks over into there. If you have a high antibody content in the spinal fluid, the likelihood of being EPM is higher. But here's the, here's the test that we did. When we looked at antibody in blood only, what we noticed was kind of a bell-shaped curve. EPMs are these, are the ones on the left. The white ones are uh, wobblers. There are other neuro disease in there, and then these are some normal horses. When we looked at spinal fluid only, well, you got a, the more antibody in the spinal fluid, the greater likelihood it was EPM, but it still wasn't perfect. But when we did an antibody ratio, looking at a, a comparison of the amount of antibody in the blood to the amount in the spinal fluid, the test became very, very accurate. So if anyone wants to ask Steve Reed, the best way to diagnose EPM, I would say, regardless of what lab you use, have an antibody measurement in blood and spinal fluid. Again, there are a few, there are occasional false positives and there are occasional some false negatives. These probably are the ones that hurt you the most, the false negatives. And why do false negatives hurt you a lot? Well, 
the reason they hurt you is because of the fact that if you get a false negative, that means a horse that really had EPM doesn't get treated. If you get a false positive, well, that also hurts the client a little bit because you treat a horse that doesn't really have the disease. So it, it costs a little bit of money. What about this organism? Well, we know that the definitive host is the possum. We know the possum will defecate the organism out and it can then affect intermediate hosts. The horse appears to be an aberrant intermediate host, but these are other intermediate hosts. Armadillos, skunks, uh, uh, we see it in uh, raccoons, we see it in cats, domestic cats, weasels, we see it in a number of other species. The second less common cause of EPM is Neospora. And the, and the name for this now is Neospora Husey, H Husey, H U G H H U G H S H I, Husey. Um, and in this one, we think the dog or some other canid is the true definitive host. Uh, the, the key thing is this is much less common in this part of the United States than it is on the West Coast but it is still a thing that we need to worry about. And the other key thing is, sometimes Neospora can be transmitted vertically. Uh, with, with sarcocystis, it's all horizontal transmission. With Neospora, it's mostly horizontal transmission, meaning they pick it up off their food, the water, the soil. But with Neospora, you can sometimes transmit it in utero. So you might get a fall with this at an early age. What do we do to treat EPM? Uh, there are several treatments that are out there. The, one of the oldest ones is a combination of um, pyrimethamine and sulfadiazine, uh, known as Rebalance. Uh, and this is an FDA approved product. Another is Marquis. And the third is Protozil. At this time, these are the three FDA approved products. Nitazoxanide was available and FDA approved, but it's been taken off the market because of some complications of GI upset. So these are the three products that are out there. Other drugs that sometimes get used, we'll talk about in a minute. Protozil is uh, in an alfalfa pellet and can be fed to the animals at a milligram per kilogram for 28 days. Marquis is a paste and needs to be given as a loading dose at 15 milligram per kilogram one day and then go to five milligram per kilogram for 28 days at the pace. And then the, uh, uh, the, the rebalance, let me back up to that one. This one is generally given for a period of, um, again, 28 to 30 days as a liquid. Uh, and you use that for uh, the same period of time uh, at one milligram per kilogram of, uh, of the uh, uh, pyrimethamine and 20 mg per kg of the sulfadiazine. Other drugs, uh, one is Toltrazerol or Baycox. This particular product, one pass through the liver becomes Panazerol, which is Marquis. So people utilize this and the, the reason it might work is it, it can become uh, the same thing as uh, uh, Marquis. Uh, another drug that's in, uh, in being tested is decox, uh, decoquinate. This is being looked at. It's an anti-coccidial for calves, but there is a, a, a lab testing uh, in Florida that's developing a product that's a combination of decoquinate with levamisole marketed as either Oroquin or Origin. Uh, and so those, and that one is working on getting FDA approval. But the FDA approved product, Benazerol Marquis, Diclazerol, which is Protozil, and Rebalance, which is Pyrimethamine Sulfadiazine. Additionally, some people will use uh, immune stimulants like Levamisol or Xylexis or Extim. Uh, there are other factors that people use to try to enhance the normal immune system of the horse. That's why we think in Albert, 
he seemed to make a treatment, but then he would relapse. And we believe that the relapse was associated with the fact that uh, perhaps there was a problem with the immune system. And this is something that we are looking at. Uh, one thing that I would say, the foundational data for all these drugs is 20 years old or more, more and we wonder if it doesn't if it doesn't underestimate how good the drugs are. So we believe that uh, if we redid this and we had more accurate, meaning that we knew better that every case we were treating really had EPM, we would get a better idea of whether or not these drugs work. Uh, there are some new treatments on the horizon. Uh, the folks here at the University of Kentucky, along with me and uh, the medical college at the uh, University of Washington, as well as a group in Spain are working to see if uh, a bump kinase inhibitor, a, a drug used to treat toxo in people and other species, might be a helpful thing. Um, and I know I'm running a little short on time, so uh, I do want to talk uh, a little bit about risk factors and how we might help prevent it. Well, one thing we know, if you live in an area in either North or South America that has possums, you have the definitive host, so you're going to have a higher prevalence. We know, too, that stress, such as travel or a, a horse being sick from another disease, or a horse that may have um, uh, to undergo a surgical procedure, anything that might suppress the immune system could make them a little bit more at risk to develop this disease. We, we know that we saw it a little bit more often in the fall. So what are the things you need to have? You need to have possums on the premise, Woods on the premises, possums live on forest edges, and so having the woods makes a higher risk factor. Two water sources actually reduces the risk factor. So if you only have one water source, we think that the possums may defecate near where they drink. So uh, if you, and they'd love to get into your feed, so if you have unprotected feed, the possums might get in there and put the organism in their stool, uh, which would then potentially cause a problem. All of these intermediate hosts are important in that they, they cannot infect a horse. So there's no reason that they can infect a horse. But if one of the intermediate hosts dies, possums are scavengers. They will go and eat that carcass, and they might then become infected, which makes them at risk of infecting your horse. Other factors, pregnancy, surgery, transport, illness, all stress factors that can decrease the immunity and uh, increase cortisol levels, and those make it uh, a little easier for the horse to get EPM. <laughs> Struggling things that we're still facing, what's the best diagnostic test? You heard that Steve Reed's opinion is an antibody ratio in a horse that has clinical signs. That's the best diagnostic test. <coughs> Excuse me, that means antibody and blood to CSF. Well, the other thing is maybe there are more parasite strains, variations that we don't know. Some might be more virulent than others. Something may be wrong with the horse's immune system. And then how much organism they get exposed to. All of these things can be important in, in risk factors. How do we prevent it? Well, there was a vaccination that was trying to be developed. But if it was easy to make vaccines against protozoal diseases, malaria would not be such a huge problem worldwide for people. So making a, a vaccine against a protozoal organism is tough. Having said that, early vaccine trials that were attempted did not work. But with newer technologies, there may be a lot more work on going back to develop a vaccine against this. I don't know. It's quite expensive to do vaccine work, and there's not a really good animal model of the disease. But there was this product that Fort Dodge tried to develop, and uh, it, it, the, the study just didn't work out. But as I said, maybe some of the new more modern technologies 
will be a, a much better way. It's just that if we're going to test a vaccine, we need a good model of the disease uh, that we can utilize. Finally, one last thing that people sometimes do is some people will feed or be treatment to animals as a potential. So some people, if you have a high incidence of EPM on your farm, might treat all the at-risk horses for the first week of the month by giving the uh, organism, they'll keep the number of protozoans in the GI tract reduced a little bit. But other things you might do, reduce risk factors as much as you can, reduce exposure to contamination by possum. And you might want to, there's no evidence to eliminate the intermediate host, maybe the definitive host, you don't need a lot of them around. So the, the big thing that is the last thing I'll say, the research on EPM is going to still be based on basic understanding of the protozoan. The more we know about the parasite, the better we'll do. If we develop better diagnostic tests, that's going to be helpful. And if we learn about the availability and the development of new anticoccidials, as I said, we've got this project. We're about to get started on a USDA-funded grant to look at these bump kinase inhibitors. And then uh, who knows whether we'll get back to the vaccine development. I think, Jamie, that's the end of what I have on uh, on uh, EPM. Did we get any questions on that? Yeah, we did. We have uh, two people. questions right now. Uh, the first one is, what are your thoughts on using stem cells for treating residual ataxia after EPM treatment? Um, I have no experience with utilizing uh, stem cells as a uh, as a, you know a part of the the treatment for EPM. Certainly. Uh, one of the things that we've tried on wobblers is giving stem cells in there, but I could not address uh, uh, in a reasonable way use of stem cells post-treatment of EPM since I haven't uh, uh, done that. So I don't want to say yay or nay to that. Okay. And then the last one is kind of a general question that may involve all of this and maybe your process. So a lot of these exams uh, start off as something else, right? They're not usually a neurological exam right from the beginning. So when a, when a client brings a horse in or calls you about a horse and it just can't, how, do, how does that whole process work? Because I'm sure a lameness exam is first and you work with other doctors. Uh, just explain your all's uh, process and how you've become to do this. Great, great question. So. As I said when I was talking about wobblers, I think that a, a brief neuro exam should be an extension of every physical examination. So I think doing uh, a little neuro exam, and oftentimes when you when a client sends a horse to one of our orthopedic surgeons, I'll notice that in addition to doing their lameness exam, they'll be walking that horse in small circles, doing some of the things that I do on the neuro exam, because that's going to be an important part of it. But you're right, you need to work as a team. If a horse starts out, like when uh, that horse that I showed in this case example started with a lameness, and you can see we were able to jog it and even walk it, but six days later, it went down and was unable to get up. I mean, how bad was that? that so you can have two things going on at the same time. Maybe it's got a little lameness, but it also could have uh, an EPM or a protozoal infection. So careful neurology following the physical exam, careful lameness exam, follow that up with, um, you know, ruling out other things. Like if it looks neuro, x-ray the neck, make sure it's not a neck problem. And you can do just the standing films to get a reasonable probability of taking that away. And then uh, if you even had to, uh, you might need to do a monogram, but usually the next step would be a standing spinal tap because then we can do the antibody ratio. And the nice thing is, at least right here in this town, and for many people, it's only, a, uh, for us, it's on the same day we submit it, we get the answer back. Even if you're a little ways away, if you submit to either UC Davis Lab or to EDS, you're gonna have an answer the next day. So the antibody ratio. And then finally, some people, if they see a horse making a funny move because they don't want to hear whether it's a wobbler, they'll just try a response to treatment. 
Yeah, and then the <laughs> final question uh, is based on, I know that, and you showed the map of if you have possums or wooded areas, uh, you're probably more susceptible to have an EPM. But how does that change as we go north to south or south to north on the East Coast, let's say? Well, on the East Coast, um, you know, wherever the highest incidence of possums are, that's where we see it. But I would say, I don't know on the East Coast if there's any difference. Like, I get horses all the way from Vermont and New Hampshire <clears throat> down to Florida. Mm -hmm. And as far west as Texas and Oklahoma, that will be referred to us. And, uh, you know, and I think EPM is not going away. We still see it as much as ever. I will say that a lot of recurring vets think that the disease is less problematic, and that's probably because, as Dr. Morrissey likes to say, treat the treatable. So if you see a clumsy horse, most people give it EPM meds before they even test it get the response to treatment. When you go to the West Coast, when you get out near the Rocky Mountains where there are no possums, no EPM. You go over and all the way down on the West Coast, now you see possums and you see some more protozoal infections and you see more Neospora. Huh. Well, thanks a lot. I don't see any other questions and we're right at just about an hour and I know you're busy and have some more uh, patients to treat today before the uh, clinic closes down. So I'd just like to say thank you so much. This was really beneficial to all horse owners out there. Uh, we'll post it on YouTube uh, and if we have any other questions, we'll follow up with you. But thanks for today and everything you do for us here at Grace and we really appreciate it. My pleasure. When you post it on YouTube, can you edit out all that part where everything was screwed up? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what we can do. Yeah, Thanks so again, Dr. That. Reed. Thanks, everybody Thanks. out there. Yeah. We really appreciate it. Uh, you bet. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Have a Brian. good day. Bye-bye.